Hello ladies and gentlemen, Nick here and welcome to my review of Doctor Who Series 6 Episodes 1 and 2, The Impossible Astronaut and Day of the Moon. And this marks a first for the series, as this is the first series opener of a new series to open with a two-part story. As previous series, series started off with single-part stories and wouldn't get to the two-parters until the fourth, or in the case of Series 2, fifth episodes. Um, it's also the first season to open with a two-parter since 1985 season 22, as seasons um, 23 to 26 opened with four-parters, um, and those ones were the usual 25-minute episode, while season 22 was the 45-minute ones. Um, and it seems like every other third, every third season from this one opens with a two-part story. So maybe series fifteen will do the same, but we'll see what series thirteen and fourteen do as well. Anyway, so series six is first two episodes. So the plot of this story is that mysterious envelopes are sent to Amy, Rory, and River, as well as a Canton um, something Delaware the third, Canton Everett Delaware the third, possibly. I might get that wrong. I'll just call him Canton. Um, but, yeah, these mysterious messages are sent to Amy, Rory and River to meet the Doctor at Lake Silencio in in America. I think, yeah, Utah, America. So, after a updated um, title sequence, which I, I won't talk too much about because I don't really talk about the Doctor Who title sequences and theme music in these reviews that much. I keep kind of... It keeps slipping my mind earlier on, so I, like with the James Bond ones, I've decided to just do a whole video or two about them once the whole series is done. Although with Bond one, I'm waiting till No Time to Die has come out. But I'll quickly just say that with these, um, the Series 6 ones, they've just brightened it a little bit. They certainly brightened the logo. The theme tune seems to be the exact same throughout, up until The Angels Take Manhattan. Um, but the title sequence for this one is the Series 5 one, but a little bit brighter, at least the logo is. From this point onwards, the title sequence includes the BBC logo with the um, the title card. Um, for some reason, I get it why it's on merchandise and stuff, but in the actual title sequence. Hmm. Then again, the way that the um, BBC logo was included on at the start of Series 5 and A Christmas Carol on the DVDs and Blu-rays wasn't that much better. I much preferred the usual square ones just appearing at the start, like on transmission, and how Series 1 to 4 and the specials did it. That was, I think that was much better done. Anyway, so, after the updated title sequence, the TARDIS crew have a picnic at Len Lake Silencio, which is Spanish for Lake Silence. Or maybe Silent Lake. lake. Um, after a, a, a gag from the Lodger being played again, there seems to be a running gag throughout the 11th Doctor's era that the 11th Doctor tries wine and then spits it out. Obviously he's not a wine person, so maybe he shouldn't bother next time. Um, anyway, so Canton then appears, an older Canton, played by the father of the actor who will actually be playing young Canton, funny enough. Anyway, so Canton turns up. And then an impossible astronaut um, appears in the, the lake. Ah, uh, title, reference. Uh, um, so the Doctor seems to know what's going on. And it turns out that he has been preparing for his death by the astronaut who may or may not be that willing to kill him. So that's exactly what happens. The astronaut kills the Doctor. Um, leaving our main compa our companions and Canton gutted and basically emotional wrecks especially amy she she's basically i think a part of her's died when she saw when she saw the doctor die a part of her's died also i also like the use of the whole um thing from the end of time where the doctor can be killed during regeneration being used that bit in the end of time was a bit of a uh, wine for, well the bit that came after that was a bit of a wine fest about it feeling like he's dying anyway but I like how here, when it looks like the 11th Doctor is regenerating, he's then killed midway through regeneration, which uh, means he is basically dead. Though, that being said, considering what we learn later in the 11th Doctor's era, it's a surprise he can actually regenerate in the first place, let alone be killed during regeneration. Oh, Stephen Moffat, you naughty, naughty man. Uh, but more on that when we get to that. Also, there's an explanation for why the... 11th Doctor can regenerate in his final incarnation here. Again, we'll get onto that. Um, not as late as um, when we get to the final regeneration story, but we'll get onto the explanation of how 11 can regenerate whilst on his final life. Hmm. Explanations will come. 
But we shall wait. Anyway, so after uh, burning the Doctor's body in a boat, which he may have placed there earlier, possibly, if he knew, um, or came back to and did it afterwards. But, yeah, afterwards, Canton introduces himself and... Uh, the companions go back to this diner which will be popping up in a future episode and some of the things that in that future episode concerning this diner doesn't quite line up with this episode for instance in um this episode there seems to be a back room in that uh, in the later episode it seems that the back room was actually something else i won't spoil it but it's it, it's in hellbent it, it'll, it'll be in hellbent again if you've seen hellbent you'll know what i'm talking about um if not, I'll tell you when we get to that one. Um, but basically, the Doctor turns up again. This time, a younger Doctor, about 909 years old. Um, whilst um, the Doctor who died earlier was 1103. So he's now over a 1,000 years when he died. But this Doctor is now back at his um, just a few years older than he was in Flesh and Stone. Um, so um, he's also been given... He's also been given a letter, as did Canton, and um, their letters have been numbered. Number one was the person the Doctor trusts the most, himself. Number two was River. What was that? Number two was River. Number three was Amy and Rory. And number four was Canton, who was also requested to bring the um, the uh, gasoline for the um, for the funeral, whilst the Doctor was told just to stick around in the um, canteen. If this review review feels a bit slow, well, I'm having to stop start so much for um, um, reasons. But anyway, yeah, the, uh, the younger Doctor meets up Amy and Rory and River at the canteen, who are a bit annoyed about what they've seen, but then soon realise um, that uh, this is a younger Doctor, and so they cannot tell him about what they've seen in the future, and they all have to go to 1969 to uh, meet up with the younger Canton and soon get themselves involved with an alien mystery. It turns out US President Richard Nixon, played by Stuart Millingen, who, fun fact, played a character in the animated story Dreamland, the, um, the uh, General Stark, that was it, General Stark. Uh, he, he plays Richard Nixon, and also, fun fact, in Day of the Moon, they actually go to Area 51, which was, in fact, Dreamland, in Dreamland, um, which that the whole story was about that, um, well, most of that story was about that. Um, but anyway, so the Doctor and company go to the White House in 1969 and team up with Nixon and um, Canton to try and solve the mystery. Um, because Nixon has been getting calls by this little girl who's afraid of a space, uh, spaceman spacesuit coming to get her, and there are she's also worried about monsters being around. Um, although it is a bit strange that Nixon thinks, um, thinks it's a boy calling him, and not instead of a girl, whilst in the prequel Minnesota, which I'll discuss in a future video, um. Because I'm going to be talking about uh, Matt Smith Minnesodes in separate videos. Um, not their individual reviews, but um, kind of videos on the Matt Smith Minnesodes. Because there's so many in the Smith era. Um, but in the uh, prequel, which should have been a pro called Prologue. And they fixed that for Series 9. But in the prequel episode, because um, it was released before the episode. But in, in that prequel Minnesode, it, um, J uh, Nixon actually... Uh, uh, calls the girl a young lady, um, but here he describes them as a boy. He thinks it's a boy, possibly due to the fact that they don't give them their ne give Nixon their name, but rather where they are, which probably probably tells um, answers. He thinks it answers his second question, but instead they're answering the first, which can be easily, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's an easy misunderstanding. Where they are is in fact on a in a building on a street corner of um, Jefferson Street, Adams Street, and Hamilton um, Avenue. Or, or um, I'm, I might be completely wrong. I only just watched the episode yesterday, but uh, memory's not terribly perfect after all. It's a place in Florida, the only place in the possibly in America where the the names of those three founding fathers have streets that are named after them meet at a junction. But before they do that, Amy has seen one of the creatures at Lake Silentio and sees one of them again 
in the White House. Uh, why they're in the White House in the first place, I don't know. But yeah, and she confronts one of them and it, it kills this innocent woman called Joy for some reason. I actually don't know why it kills Joy to show off its power, I guess. Um, but uh, I don't know why. Uh, it, it, yeah, uh, this whole bit is a bit of a question mark of what's it doing in the first place. But I guess it's a way to introduce the silence, um, the monsters, before we, we know who they are, we get introduced to the monsters themselves. Um, and then we find a whole bunch of them at the um, address where the, the gang is investigating with Canton in tow. And they, uh, River and Rory investigate these tunnels and find their own tar uh, a TARDIS piloted by the silence, which looks very much like the one from the lodger. Hmm. A coincidence? Maybe? Um, and then the spacesuit comes and eats the girl and has her taken, put her inside the um, spacesuit. And then Amy... Um, try attempts to kill the astronaut as she's worried that's what kills the doctor in the future um, However, she does not realize the girls inside. Also, she reveals she's pregnant to the doctor Wait a minute Amy Pond's pregnant <gasps> How will this turn out in part two well it turns out Amy was wrong. She wasn't pregnant. She was just feeling very unwell Bam dabby doozy. Um, in, fact, in fact, part two's opening. Oh. Okay, the positives. Um, the opening is actually quite in, um, fun and um, a, a bit action-packed, which is good for an action fan like me. And... If the, if it made sense with the, within a story context of the characters going on the run from the FBI, it would probably be a pretty interesting story, or the end of a pretty interesting story. But okay, Canton is with working with the, these guys, and secondly, what is the why are they on the run in the first place? If they're trying to track down silence if they're trying to witness silence and mark themselves with them and then count down the days till the astronaut launch in july why do they have to pretend to go on the run from the fbi they never actually explain if it's to show themselves as enemies of the of america and therefore um the, um put make sure the science don't know that they're actually working with the president and with the fbi instead and they have the whole fbi pretending to go after them blah 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 that's never explained it just feels like it was just there so that um, the three, three of the four main characters could go on location filming in America for some action scenes. And even then, only the Amy one is that is action packed. She's in the Valley of the Gods in Utah. Utah again. Um, River Song is in New York. New York again. And Rory is at a dam in Arizona, which I would say is a nice new location, except that it, this one doesn't get much as use as the other two. So, yeah. Also, the Doctor is, for some reason, being incarcerated in a perfect prison, not unlike the Pandorica, but a different one, in Area 51 um, in Nevada. Again. Um, so... Yeah, this whole pre-title scene is pretty pointless prior to the very last bit at the end. It is absolutely pointless. There is no reason for Amy, Rory and, the River, and River to go on the run from Canton and the FBI. If they were pretending it so that the silence thought that the FBI would be after them, then it would make sense. But you have to explain that. But as that's not explained, then it's pointless, apart from just to show off parts of America on screen. And even then, uh, uh, I think that could have been handled better by actually going to the actual places in the story. What is so wrong about that? But anyway, the Doctor and sends Canton and Amy to a children's home to find the little girl. And everyone has been given these little messages inside their hands, these little devices, nano thingies, that can record messages that... Um, can re remind the people if they've seen a silence or anything uh, that they may not have noticed. And that 
it works really well with the demonstration bit in the TARDIS with Canton, and then with a really creepy and horror bit with Amy in the children's home. This episode does horror and uh, scariness pretty well, to be honest. That's probably its biggest achievement. I think it's safe to say Stephen Moffat can write horror really, really well. And also, Toby Haynes is back directing this two-parter after directing the last three episodes, although not all back-to-back, -back, as this one was in a later production block to some of the later episodes of this series. Um, so, Pandora Copen's Big Bang, I think that might have been the end of the series. No, it wasn't the end of the series five filming block. And then you had, I think there was one more after that. And then um, Christmas Carol, and then a few more, uh, one or two in Series 6 before this two-parter. So, Toby Haynes says, whilst he's been directing the uh, five episodes back-to-back -back in order of broadcast, it's not been in back-to-back -back in order of actually filming them. But I think Toby Haynes directs this, um, is it Toby Haynes? I could be wrong. Um, directs this story really well, and I think it's um, a great horror vibe to it. Uh, anyway, so the Doctor is then doing something with Apollo 11, and President Nixon has to get him out of trouble for uh, it when he gets caught, uh, with River and Rory as the representatives. And then the doc um, after Amy then gets kidnapped by the science after for encountering the little girl, I would say this encounter would be a bit em kind of emotional, especially after Amy finds a picture of herself with a baby, which seems to be this little girl. I would say this is an emotional moment, except... Um, in the next time trailer, oh yeah, this is possibly the worst next time trailer ever made, where it basically show the very first bit shows Amy apologising to the little girl for shooting her, um, so basically removing all tension there of what's happened, as well as basically showing us um, that all the characters may basically get out alive, so to speak, as opposed to leaving it on a cliffhanger where they could be killed. Hmm, yeah, not a very good cliffhanger. They may as well not have bothered. So anyway, so, yeah, the silence capture Amy, and, yeah, I, for some reason, I, they say that she's got a part to play, and then they put her to, uh, try to put her to sleep again after waking up for a while. What's the point of putting her to sleep again if she's only just woken up? Um, yeah, the silence kidnapping Amy is pointless, to be honest, actually. I don't think it's actually needed. It's, it's sort of a way to get... Rory and the Doctor emo a bit more emotional and and cause a bit of a, um, not a rift between them, but uh, Rory starts to worry that Amy's um, kind of um, relying on the Doctor and is begging for the Doctor to come and save her, more or less, in her, her mind. And then um, when she's admitting her love for Rory, um, he thinks he she's saying it to the Doctor due to the words describing him describing it as dropping out of the sky which is a figure of speech on her end but for Rory he thought it meant the doctor literally fell out of the sky um there's also the bit where the doctor and River examine the astronaut suit after the little girl somehow manages to escape from it which does end up almost killing her um but we'll get more onto that more towards the end and she is uh it's, as it turns out she is badly wounded for about six months more or less, but again, more on that later. And then there's this bit where River says, our paths are intertwined, your future is my past, my first and my last, blah, blah, blah. When the Doctor's wondering about the letters. Yeah, River, that doesn't really explain the letters. Even if you're trying to be still, not reveal anything, you don't have to tell us what we already bloody know. <sighs> Whilst there's some pretty good bits in Dave the Moon, like the horror-esque, As aspects and Canton's a really great supporting character um, and the ending's pretty decent there are, seems to be some bits on the way that just feel a bit meh this episode's uh, a little bit meh come to think of it it's a bit, bit more enjoyable when watching it but there's some bits that don't uh, um, don't need to be there um, um, anyway so eventually the Doctor has Canton record an injured silence um, say you should kill us all on sight, which he then plays to a part of the message uh, of the... He plays the message during the broadcast of the Apollo landing so that everyone turns against the silence. Um, and basically, he has... And Rory quickly rescues Amy whilst the Doctor and River take on this whole bunch of silence at their TARDIS. Um, somehow the sonic screwdriver can now shoot lasers for some reason. River kicks bottom in this scene, but why the sonic screwdriver shoots lasers? Even if it doesn't actually harm any of the silence, it's still a bit silly. 
I mean, okay, I can understand the laser shooting, but at people, at beings, if, uh, yeah, uh, if it, if it shot at inanimate objects as a way to help, like opening a door from a long distance, perhaps if it, if it needed some sort of a pinpoint accuracy, yes, um, but at people, isn't like it's shooting a laser at people, like River's gun, not too much. But River Kicking, Kicking Bottom was really cool, though, and that was a really great reaction, um, executed, directional, and edited, and cinema uh, choreographed scene. That was really well put together. Um, uh, so eventually, um, they say thank you to Nixon, and they uh, uh, go off again. Well, River's returned back to Storm Cage, where she has her, f well, the Doctor's first kiss with her, and what might be her last kiss? But then again, she once she gets out of Storm Cage, she'll probably have a few more sm smooches with the Doctor. Possibly. You never know. Um, and then the Doctor, Amy and Rory travel back throughout um, uh, time and space. And the Doctor sort of realises that Amy is sort of kind of pregnant or kind of not it's when he's scanning her. And it's kind of the TARDIS doesn't seem to be able to make up its mind. We'll find out more about this um, later on, although this does to be seem to be the recurring element of this half of the series, not to mention the uh, mystery of the little girl, who in the very final scene, we see her being able to regenerate six months after the events of the of the store, of the second half of the story, she's able to regenerate. Wow. What? Wow. Um, so, okay. This is interesting. Hmm. And not long before this, Amy was worried about somehow being having a time a child with a time head or alien abilities. Interesting. Don't screw this up, Moffat. I do have to say about this reoccurring element, and in fact the whole um story arc of the Doctor's death. Um, recent over the last couple of months since the since series twelve aired this year. I've been saying that Series 13, if it's going to be following up on many of these elements, which it should do, um, because we've got a lot of questions, but if it does, it needs to prioritise those stories. It needs to prioritise actually explaining what's going on and um, start, to, start to answer some of the questions blah, and all that stuff. It can't do um, what Series 12 did with have a couple of episodes where don't, not only do they not contribute anything to the overall arc, overall arc but they didn't even mention it. It's basically the Series 11 business as usual style for those for some of those episodes, whilst the other ones then get crammed with the lore and series arc, etc. So Series 13 really needs to prioritise itself. And the same could be said for Series 6, as it seems to be that half the series is business as usual, with this arc of her uh, hanging over us, and half of it is very um, connected to it. But I am okay with doing some of the other adventures, it's just that some of them do need to connect with the story arc or have hints of it. And while some of them will, some of them will be business as usual, maybe with the Doctor um, looking at Amy's um, pregnancy scan in the first half and in the second half looking at his information about his death pit. Um, but I think, yeah, considering we've got a big story arc here, um, Every episode now counts in telling this story arc or building to this, uh, to the finale, or building the character emotions. And that's something I think Series 12 half succeeded and half failed at, because half the episodes were um, dedicated to, or just over half the episodes were dedicated to the story arc or telling stories connected to it. But the rest of the series had absolutely nothing to do with it, not even a not even a mention. So series six and series thirteen when it comes have to have to prioritize their episodes, focus on uh, the story arcs, but also connect the um references or connect or other episodes to either the story arc or to have some sort of reference coming up. For instance, in the Doctor's Wife, the whole thing about um the only water in the forest is the river. That is something that ties up with episode 7, and also in Night Terrors of the whole TikTok chant song thing. Okay, that's a bit of a stretch, but it makes a bit more sense. So, series 6 and 13 have to prioritise their stories. Which ones should they tell, and which ones um, need to connect with the series arc, or, and which ones need to just reference it, and, and, and have to actually have some sort of time with it. 
Um, with Series 6, like I said, some of them are going to have some sort of hint towards stuff, and other ones are going to be directly tie-in, and other ones are going to be kind of, it's going to be the main focus. So we, we do need some sort of prioritisation in some of these stories, especially for these big overarching ones. Stuff like Bad Wolf, Torchwood, Mr. Saxon, The Cracks in Time and The Hybrid, they didn't need to worry as big because they uh, as much, but uh, ones like The Doctor's Death, Amy's Pregnancy and The Destruction of Gallifrey and The Mystery of the Timeless Child, they all need series-long priority. And I don't think 6 and 12 give a complete series-long priority, but let's, let's see how Series 6 does handle what we've got, and hopefully Series 13 will prioritise its episodes when the time comes. So going back to Series 6, like I said, some of them do, some of them not so much. Especially in the second half. The second half, they really loosen it a little bit. Um, um, also, I do have to mention, um, this is the second time recently that we've had this whole the Doctor is going to die thing, following the 2008-10 to 10 specials having it as a theme and it's going to be done again with series seven having to hold the doctor is going to die on trends and all stuff and then series nine again with the with the uh the confession dial this is a trend that has to stop after I mean, series six fine it's a really interesting complex concept okay but afterwards um it really needs to stop especially by series nine where it just gets where it just feels like it doesn't even need to be there so that's one thing I'll I'll give Chibnall credit for. He hasn't done this um, story arc yet. Maybe for the final thirteenth Doctor story, which is fine if it's if it's restricted to the final episode or final few episodes, uh, sort of with like with sort of with tenth Doctor, sort of like with the tenth Doctor, but not as much of an overarc story, but more the last couple of episodes were kind of build into it, but. As a series long arc, including the specials, it really needs to go away and not come back for a long time. Um, as for this story, um, this story, I really liked the first episode. Impossible Astronaut is a great suspense mystery thriller with a great emotional start with the Doctor's supposed death and his companions having to come to terms with that whilst travelling with the younger Doctor and having to avoid not telling him, whilst also setting up this mystery with the Silence, who may or may not have something to do with this, uh, with the Doctor's death. Um... And also the whole stuff in 1969. That's pretty cool and some really good story. And Day of the Moon kind of continues some of the story. But there's also parts of Day of the Moon that are a bit meh. The opening didn't need to be, well, as it was. Um, the silence kidnap Amy just because. And considering what we find out about Amy later on in this first half of the series. They really, really, really didn't need to bother kidnapping her here. As, spoiler alert, they've already done that. More on that later on, but yeah, and just some bits just feel a bit meh in episode two. It just feels like it's a bit of a weakest uh, follow-up. The Matt Smith era only has four, two, five two-part stories in its entire era, and I think all but one of them have um, two-parters that actually get weaker following the first half. Um, the, the only one that doesn't is the Big Bang following the Pandoric Opens. That one might even be better uh, than that um, than the Pandoric Opens, but... But the rest, the second episodes usually pale when compared to the first ones, especially if the first ones are fantastic. Uh, Time of Angels was amazing, and I loved The Hungry Earth, but their follow-ups, Flesh and Stone and Cold Blood, didn't quite live to their potential. But in those two cases, those two were still really good episodes as well. And later on, we'll have The Rebel Flesh, which wasn't really that much, I don't think he's that good to begin with. I think that's a pretty weak one. And then it's followed up by the dog shit known only as the almost people. Again, more on that when we get to that one. Prepare for a fucking rant when it when it comes to that two part of probably the biggest of the era that were assigned on the Daleks. Um but um this story, I think the second part is a bit meh compared to the first one, which was really great. I thought that one was really great, especially the first half where it's all setting up the mystery of the story and of the series. Really brilliantly done. And again, like I said earlier, prioritizing. Prioritization, which is something not every episode will do in this series. I have just been talking in length about that, just not not that long ago. Um so yeah, I think that one handled it really well. I think the 
acting from our guest stars, particularly Canton and Nixon, have been really great. Um, Matt Smith is fantastic, once again, as the 11th Doctor. That's going to get repetitive, I know, but it's the truth. Um, also, I'm really liking Alex Kingston's River Song. Her, obviously, her River Song's a bit uh, younger than it is Two Sites in the Library, so she's a bit more flirty and a bit more uh, light-hearted uh, and less um, older and wiser, more open to enjoyment and uh, excitement. However, in this story, she does seem to be a little bit more, um, there seems to be more of a darker personal side to her than there was in the previous two encounters with her, as she's starting to, she starts to show um, parts of her past re um, reminiscing, well, not reminiscing, but starting to hint at um, darker times ahead, perhaps, back in her her uh, younger days, as well as start um, fearing for her future, where once she meets the Doctor who never seen her before, she's she thinks she's going to die after it's going to kill her, which is sort of what happens. Then again, Big Finish has made her meet previous Doctors and will make her meet the 10th Doctor again. But then again, that's apparently that's, they, she gets mind-wiped after all that. She mind-wipes them after all that. It's only with Science and Library Foster the Dead that she probably wasn't able to mind-wipe the Doctor because of her sacrifice there. And then post-Science and Library stories probably wouldn't need it to... Well, maybe she would because Time Angels would be the next meet, his next meeting with her. Uh, it, Big Finish making her meet the Doctors prior to 10 has now complicated everything. I mean, it would be fine if it wasn't for the fact that 10 didn't actually know who she was. It might actually just be better to keep her meeting future Doctors. Oh wait, that of course there's a bit of an issue when we came to Husbands of River Song. Goodness sake, this character is pretty tricky to um, let meet any other Doctor besides Eleven. I'm going to stop talking about that because I'm just going to get everybody confused, myself included. No, especially included. Um, Amy and Rory are great, especially since Amy seems to have part of her being killed. Uh, like I said, I think a part of her dies when she sees the Doctor being killed. It, she, it's just, she's broken by that. And she's still kind of damaged when she's uh, she doesn't know whether to tell the Doctor or not. I also like how Rory's taking a bit more... Um, not charged, but he's certainly getting more involved with all of this. Now he is a main companion. He is getting more involved with going on. He's, um, like I said, back with Vampires of Venice, they're kind of buddy-buddy by then. So he's definitely come more buddy-buddy by now, and especially uh, because of um, Amy. And he's and because he's probably the one who's keeping the coolest head about the situation, so he's um, being the one who's probably making the smartest decisions. Also, I like how he gets to interact with River quite a lot. We got quite a bit of Amy River interaction in Time of Angels, Flesh and Stone. So it's great to have Rory interact with River quite a lot in um, the first episode of this. Well, both episodes, I should say, but specifically in the first part. Um, so, yeah, that's really about it. Oh, and the Silence. They're a really great creepy monster. They're really great. Apart from why they kill Joy and kidnap Amy, um, I don't actually know what that's all about but besides that they proved to be really creepy and scary monsters who want to put this little girl inside this space suit for some reason i don't actually know why they want to put her in this space suit i mean i can understand why they will want to put the person in the space suit who then kills the doctor when it comes to that but are they hoping that this little girl is going to kill the doctor at this point in time if so, and there will be explanations about this later on, explanations about who wants the Doctor dead and why, but I don't actually know why they would want to put the little girl into this spacesuit now, considering who she grows up to be, and that eventually they do end up being put into that spacesuit, or another spacesuit, and then assassinating the Doctor through that. Actually, I'm not even sure why they bothered with that specific, specific plan in the first place. Why don't you, you just get them to kill the Doctor, and, and even then, um, there's the earlier attempt, there's attempts between this and then by this character, who then attempts to kill the Doctor uh, at a later date in their life, but an earlier point before they're then forced back into the new spacesuit, or the original one again. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, the silence plan to kill the Doctor doesn't make sense, because they're just, they're just trying everything they can. And this relates to Series 5 and the future as well. It just, they just try to kill the Doctor any way they can, but it doesn't always make sense. It's it's trying to work on a story level, but on overall, it doesn't quite make sense. And if it wasn't, they weren't trying to kill the Doctor now, 
then what was the point in putting the girl in the suit? It doesn't make sense. Come on, Moffat. I know you're building a mystery and trying to be oh so clever, but come on, at least make it se try to make some sort of sense in the long run. Even if it was just going to be a practice run, that would make some sort of sense. I also have to mention, whilst uh, Richard Nixon is a pretty good character in this episode, um, the more I hear of the guy, he's not the, he's not a very likeable person in real life. I won't slam him too much, uh, especially as I'm mainly talking about this character for this purposes of this review. But the more I hear of Richard Nixon as a person in, in real life, I'm not really a fan of him. Uh, he, he was president during the, uh, Vietnam, although his predecessor def uh, was definitely start of that. Um, there was the whole Watergate scandal, and that followed the events of the film The Post. And he's, uh, I think he certainly wanted to put legal action against The Post in that film, certainly because of them reporting on the Vietnam stuff. Um, and yeah, he was definitely coming across... In that film, he definitely came across as a dick, so naturally I wouldn't have liked him there. But even if The Post were doing something wrong or illegal, or blah, blah, blah... Um, that's uh, that still doesn't give him a free pass, especially as um, you know, there's some also there's these drugs in America that they're illegal, and apparently there was a study by some of them saying that they're fine, they're fine, they're safe, they can be used for recreational drugs, and they presented it to Nixon, and he said, "No, no, I'm completely ignoring this because I want to, I want to have black people and Mexicans put in jail because I don't like them." And the whole war on drugs thing is basically a whole racism thing. Yeah, there was prob yeah, there's probably uh, quite a few drugs that are really bad for you. That's why there most of them are illegal um, in the 21st century. And some of the ones that were formerly legal can be legal in some American states or other co or different countries or for medicine. Um, but Nixon's whole thing about banning them was not because drugs were because the drugs were um, they were sa uh, unsafe. It was because he wanted to put people in jail. Uh, that he didn't like, um, but unlike Stalin and uh, Hitler, um, this was through ta this was tactical rather than um, stupid stupidity. I mean, it was stupid, yeah. But uh, Hitler and Stalin weren't subtle with their arrests. They they just arrested anyone they didn't like. With Nixon, he just tried to um, have something made illegal and then have someone selected out as some sort of um, scapegoat. Um, yeah, scapegoats such as black people and Mexicans. And that's where the whole war on drugs thing came along, because it was racism rather than trying to stop drug use. Although that was probably a secondary uh, thing, but racism was probably the primary one. And thankfully, any war on drugs that are happening today are probably more centred about stopping illegal drugs. But yeah, Nixon, he didn't like black people, basically. Can't of think what he would have liked, thought about the civil rights movement. And... Also, I've heard that he tried to um, cover a report about um, tra um, LGBT people not being mentally ill, as conducted by some another person who conducted this research, um, or reconducted it, as someone else had previously done that, but then it was destroyed by the Nazis. Um, but they reconstruct, redid this research, and Nixon tried to hide it. So Nixon's not an LGBT person either. And it wouldn't be so much of a problem, I mean, it is problematic, but it wouldn't be so much of a problem if it... If he was just trying to make excuses or try and hide it. You know, just the more I hear of this guy, the less I like him. As a character in this episode, he is okay, but I'm just liking the guy less in real life as time goes on. Also, we get that, we get the, um, the, the back bit at the end where Canton does reveal he wants to marry a black man. And you can see Nixon kind of a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of Canton wanting to marry someone who's black. And then, like... Almost sickly, like in his facial expressions when he finds out it's a man. Hmm. Well, give Stephen Moffat this. He, he managed to accurately ca capture the the, the um, real life person. If all of this is indeed true, which I believe it is. Um. Um. Also, the gay joke again. Well, actually, it's a, I know it's a, it's a bit of a forced gay joke in there, but then again, like I said, it's sort of reflects Nixon's as a person as well and you can see in his facial expressions capturing what the real man would have probably thought of, thought of it hmm yeah I don't think Nixon's been written in a way to make us sympathize or like him like Winston Churchill but uh, trying to uh, um, hide this I also have to I also find that um, the 
um, security man who is shouting a lot at the doctor and company, and he's getting all uh, worried. He's he's definitely got the president's best interests in mind, but they gave all of those lines to this one person who is a black man, and he gets, keeps being told to shut up by Canton or the president. And I feel that, that that is slightly racial in some sort of a way. I think it would have been good if maybe some of the lines, or at least a bit where he's talking to Amy about the bathroom, should have been given to a white guy. Maybe it could have been even out between the two. Possibly. Could have, maybe one of them was, maybe the white guy was trying to one-up the black guy, and he was the one who was shut up by, told to shut up by the president, whilst Canton was the one to tell, uh, tell it to the black guy. This would also show that Canton doesn't really care about race when it comes to this situation. He only cares about doing the job, whilst the president, it would be more of a racial thing, I, I would think. Certainly knowing this president. Anyway, that's enough of the politics in this story. See, Doctor Who was political before 2017. <laughs> There are still people who are saying it wasn't. There are still people ignorant to think there wasn't politics before the casting of Jodie Whittaker or before Series 10 was released. Just stop lying! I mean, if you think it's more political these days, fine. But to say it was never political before, stop lying! Go and watch Series 1 again. That's a very good example. Or, or the, the first Dalek story. Do I need to keep reminding you guys? The ones of you who are actually sensible, I'm sorry, but the same, I don't know, I don't know if the same people watch these videos, but those same people, I still have to address them. They may not be watching these videos, but they still, ex they're still out there and they're still spreading these lies. So I have to keep telling them off, even if they aren't watching, but the message has to be spread. If you guys can tell them off as well, that would be fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. You'll probably get free Christopher Eccleston audio. Okay, that was a lie. I'm sorry. You probably won't get a free Christopher Eccleston audio. Um, you'll have to buy them when they come out. But here, yeah, if I could give you a free Christopher Eccleston audio before the, the big finished ones come out, I would as a reward for your for your kindness and, thank, and you, your support and everything else and being sensible. Thank you, by the way. So, anyway, uh, Impossible Astronaut Day of the Moon, fantastic start, meh follow-up. Um, yeah, um, it's an alright story. Um, overall, I think it's okay. I was going to, I originally had this down as a 7 out of 10, I was going to bunk it up to an 8. But, you know, after thinking about it, the second half is a bit of a meh story, it, uh, a bit of a meh episode. It's got some good bits, but overall, it's meh. So I will be giving The Impossible Astronauts and Day of the Moon a 7 out of 10. Yeah, I think it's... A good start to Series 6. I think Episode 1 is a great way to start, but series, Episode 2 kind of falls a little bit flat when we get to it. I think Episode 2 is a bit of a meh episode, whilst Episode 1 is really great. So that's why I got, gave it the 7. Um, I, like I said, it was almost an 8, but after thinking about it a bit more, Episode 2 is very meh. So, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time for another meh episode. The Curse of the Black Spot. Until then, I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. <laughs>